Hi everyone, Trina here. And um, last night I was reading from a book and it is The Angelic Origins of the Soul by Trisha McCannon. And this is, a, like I said, a beautiful book. And I started reading it last night and I got some feedback from you all and you said you'd like to hear more. And that's awesome because I thought this book was absolutely amazing and um, I would love to share it with you. So we left off last night um, um, kind of defining the breath of life and the unknowable, the supreme Brahman, the absolute with the qualities from source. So as we were discussing that, we were getting into the part of the breath and the supreme, the great, the hidden in all things, um, the being according to their bodies, the one breath of the whole universe, the Lord, whom knowing men become immortal. I know that almighty spirit, the shining sun beyond the darkness. I know him, the unfading, the ancient, the soul of all, the omnipresent by his nature, whom the Brahman know and call the unborn, whom they call eternal. So this is where we left off. And um, from there, it goes into Saguna Brahman contains all three functions of creation. Preservation and destruction, thus encompassing the Trimurti, I, I hope that's how it's pronounced, or Trinity of Hinduism. Brahman, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Yet, only Brahman is the supreme source of consciousness that gives birth to the golden egg of creation. And I literally saw the golden egg of creation, and when um, that was shown to me, it was shown to me in a very interesting way, and because um, I didn't have this concept at all in my mind. And this was when I was younger, probably in my late 20s, early 20s. And I saw a dragon give birth to this beautiful golden egg. And then the egg gave birth to the entire cosmos. So it was crazy beautiful the way they were showing this to me. But it was shown to me that the cosmic egg of physicality comes from a plasma being dragon. So I don't know if that's right or not, but... Maybe symbolically or metaphorically it's correct. I don't know. But I thought that was a profound vision. But that was literally how I saw the cosmic egg being birthed was from a plasma dragon. She was beautiful. And she held the cosmic egg within her womb. And she gave birth to it. And it created physical um, material worlds. It was, it was amazing. So the golden egg or the golden womb in Vedic philosophy, this is the cosmic egg. It is thought to be the source of the manifested cosmos, and it is found in the creation myths of many ancient cultures. It is said the first primordial aspect of the divine was birthed from it, marking the beginning of the universe. And this is what I saw, and I literally saw a female dragon. In Egypt, the first created being was called Ra, the Lord of Light. In Hinduism, it's Brahma, the creator God. In Theosophy, it is Adam Kadamon, or universal being, that represents the fullness of our human godlike potentials. Vedic cosmology believes that each multi dunius universe is created by one of these great cosmic eggs floating on the cosmic waters of space. Waters of space. I've also seen that too, that space is water. So the great, this great deception of the millions of galaxies we have discovered with our telescopes, each a universe unto itself in the vastness of space. Saguna Brahma, Brahman, however, is the one who resides in the many, the spark of the soul itself. That universal being 
that contains all and which is all put into motion the soul and the world and all that nature comprises. Below, Saguna, Brahma, there are other gods, great souls who have been put in charge of a galaxy, a universe, or even an entire dimension. Yet each of these powers is but more limited of an expression of the great eternal one. That's the fractaling. Each, each level um, or each dimension or um, it depends on the power that that being has bestowed with it. It's what it is formed into next. But you fractal down your, your original power and this comes from an original grand source. And um, this is kind of what they're explaining is, you know, they're saying that different beings rule over different dimensions and different universes and different different things. And I've even seen like angels over different countries of the United States and different areas of the world. Like there's dominions over specific cities, towns, counties, counties. And then I've seen larger beings that reside over like a whole region. And then larger beings over that, that control the over the whole water. And then ones that go over the whole land. And it's crazy. They're these beings are in charge of different aspects and they hold different keys of frequency to perform their dis different tasks of creation. So, um, so yet these of these powers is but a more limited expression of the great eternal one. In the Hindu tradition, these universal guardians called the Brahmandas or those who oversee the material manifestations. They are the overseeing consciousness that helps to regulate the immensity of creation in every universe. While the more immense the human beings, they are never le never less, nevertheless living sparks in the body of God. Eastern wisdom teaches that the spark of the Brahman lies buried deep within each of us. This is the indwelling soul of the creator called the Atman, which slumbers like a cosmic seed waiting to be awakened. Like the Greek word atmos, meaning air, this is the living life force or spirit that animates the soul. That is so beautiful. So Adam, he's still sleeping. That's what I've always thought. And when I read this, I was like, that's exactly what I saw. Adam is still sleeping. So it, it, I'll read that again. In Eastern wisdom, it teaches that the spark of the Brahman lies buried deep within each of us. This is the indwelling soul of the creator called the Atman which slumbers like a cosmic seed waiting to be awakened. Seeds burst forth under the proper conditions and the proper manifestations available to, to make it activate. And I've been shown my whole life we came here to plant new seeds, like the seeds that were sleeping within the earth. We would reawaken them and they would burst forth from the soil. From the soil and we would create new manifestations upon the earth by planting and birthing these seeds from the old the old the old blueprints the old ways so like the greek word atmos meaning air this is the living life force the spirit that animates our soul if brahman is the soul of all that is then atman is the cosmic soul that has been scattered throughout the universe in us, the one whose living fire indwells and sustains all living beings. And that's what I saw. The spark is in everything. Everything has a little tiny piece of this. Humans obviously have a little bit more. Angels have more. Um, it depends on the, the energy of the being, but they all have more. But this human expression that you are is a fractal of your own light. Like, like, like the God being fractals down, you also fractal down because your source light that came out of source light is a sun and it's huge. 
So your human expression is a fractal from that fractal, if that makes sense, but that's how it was shown to me. So the lotus flower and the rose. The Buddha likened the idea of rising our consciousness to a lotus flower rising from the muck and the mire. In one of the most famous sermons, he didn't speak at all, but merely held up the lotus flower. Both Hindu and Egyptian cultures chose this lotus to symbolize the eternal journey of the soul. Like the lotus, it rises from the muddy depths, representing all the pain and the ignorance that we seem to endure upon our path to enlightenment. As the lotus pushes up towards the light, it blossoms into a thousand-petal lotus, the symbol of the crown chakra, which allows us to connect with our divine self, the sun above you, your sun, your true sun, your sun soul spark. That's the divine, the divine above you. So as we awaken into the light of our own being, many spiritual paths have conceived of the soul as a feminine expression of the great mother sojourning through the worlds below. In fact, there are elements of the natural world that will support the idea that the soul is feminine in nature. In the past 60 years, science has discovered that all mammals are created biologically female first. The male is formed only by the release of an, addi of an additional androgen, androgen. So, which is of course contrary to the teachings of the patriarchal religion that would suggest and have us believe that it is the male who created first. Since the microcosmic world is a reflection of the macrocosmic realms, as above, so below. And then the creator has long believed to be a feminine presence. After all, it is only women who give birth. So who could have birthed the cosmos but the divine mother of us all? She is the hidden principle of the plenum, the dark matter. Oh, see, that's what I saw. The dark, the void, the dark space. That's all mom. That's all the womb of creation sitting there waiting to become activated by sound and love and light. And when it hits, they collide and it creates new life. So the dark matter, she is the black Madonna. She is the virgin of the world who gives birth to universe before anything else existed. In Persian culture, she is called Armati, Armati, the goddess of wisdom who created the universe. Some call her the earth mother or the goddess of the underworld for she regulates all cycles of life and death and rebirth. We emerge from her cosmic womb to be reborn to a human mother that lives on Gaia or Mother Earth. At night, we gaze up at the Milky Way, the mother's milk of stars. We drink from her springs each day and eat from her fields. She is constantly giving birth to a million myriad forms of life. From the womb to the tomb, we are children of the sacred feminine, and we carry her divine spark within us. It is important to note that some near-death near experiences who have traveled to the other side and returned to reveal that they have also encountered a divine presence as the following. My situation was strangely enough something akin to that of a fetus in a womb. In this case, the mother was God, the creator, the source who was responsible for making the universe and all in it. The being was so close to that, there it seemed to be no distance at all between God and myself. Yet, at the time, at the same time, I could sense the infinite vastness of the Creator. <clears throat> I could see how completely minuscule I was by comparison. That's what I mean. We're so small in comparison. But our smallness, it, 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 
it holds the essence of the fullness. So your smallness is your greatest power. Greatest power is in your smallness. Never forget that. It's true. So the Divine Comedy, Dante, relates that when we reached the Empyrean of the highest heaven that appeared to him, it was an, an image of the Queen of Heaven and embodied. First in Dante's spiritual guide, Beatrice, and then her higher manifestation as the mother of all. Her symbol, he writes, as the white rose, layered like the soul itself with the many petals that comprise our subtle energy bodies. Those are the invisible bodies that we can't see, but nonetheless, they are one with us. Right now, right here. They are wrapping your body. They are layers, layers of energy and wisdom and connection to the cosmic egg of the mother and the father. It's profound. It's all inside of you, in your own essence, in your own energy field. You carry all of this information. So, the, cloth, the cosmic seed and the tree of life. In Plato's time, this various mystery school compared the soul to a cosmic seed that has fallen from the tree of life and certainly this oval form, just like what Wayne saw, the oval seed. I was like, ah, there's Wayne's seed. It's from the shape of our auric body and that's what I saw. They match. The ancients believed that the soul is like a seed. It is imbued with the blueprint of the entire cosmos. Yet it knows not. Instead, it is layered with various energy bodies, physical, astral, mental, emotional, and causal. And these are both helpful in growth. One, two, three, four, five. Five bodies attached to the seven chakras makes 13. And these are both helpful in its growth and development, as well as limiting the soul's ability to be in touch with its own eternal nature. The seed can only grow into awareness over time by meeting the various lessons and challenges of lifetimes. It does so best when it is nourished by love, love, light, and sound. It is the keys to the universe. The tree of life is a soul's parent, a force that is rooted in the absolute. The kathana, or the katha, a Upanishad, describe this as the eternal aswatha tree, which spreads its shoots downward, thus creating, a, creating billions of worlds. And this is the symbol that they show. Beneath it are spread out in all dimensions. This mystical tree is an energetic bridge between the realms of heaven and the realms of earth, producing a road map so the soul can find its way back home. One day the ancient wisdom teachers teaches each soul will become one with the tree of life, having attained mastery over many countless eons of time. The tree is a rainbow bridge that binds heaven and earth together. The rainbow bridge. <laughs> and it binds heaven and earth together. I saw that this was our task, our purpose for being incarnated at this time, was to create this bridge. So, the tree is the rainbow bridge that binds heaven and earth together. Therefore, it is not surprising that many of these great world saviors have been linked to this tree including Jesus, Osiris, Krishna, Odin, Thoth, and Quetzalcoatl. And finally, realized God-men. Their job was to act as mediators or bridges between the heavenly realms and the dimensions of form, that is, the earth. Reminding each soul that the divine spark is inside of us. This sacred geometry is the seed of life 
and it is drawn with the six perfect with six perfect circles around a centric centrical circle representing the six movements of creation spoken in the Bible. These movements were honored as the six days of creation and the seventh being the day of rest. Be still and know that I am. <laughs> Represented in the holy day of the Sabbath, Saturday. This is the six-sided mandala that also symbolizes the six lokas or worlds or dimensional planes written about in the Bardo, Tholdo, better known in the West as the Tibetan Book of the Dead. These six dimensions all rotate around the seventh celestial kingdom, where it is said our true self resides. In the seventh celestial kingdom is where your true self resides. So, seven are above, folks. You gotta go to seven or above. <laughs> A roosh, go above roosh. We have to get to seven or above. So, this this okay. So we rode around. We rotate around the seventh celestial kingdom, which is where our true self resides. These seven lokas or dimensions were also thought of in the mystery schools as corresponding to the seven chakras. <laughs> I knew it, or the seven subtle energies of bodies that, comp that comprise the matrix of who we are. This six-sided geometry, six around the seventh, the central circle, is embedded in many places of creation, forming the hex hexagonal basis for the entire mineral kingdom. Mystical, teaches re mystical teachings reveal that it is form of this tree of life that is the flower of that is where the flower of life emerges the flower is a template for how the growth of one kingdom becomes the foundation of the next this is not only the true this is not only true in building blocks of matter but also in the interdependence of all various kingdoms from mineral to plant to animal to human, each kingdom building upon the last. The flower of life design was taught in the temples of ancient, ancient Egypt and can still be found today within its ruins. These are the two symbols that they were showing, the six petal and then the flower of life. Of the temple of Abydos, lasered, lasered onto one of the granite stones, lasered. So, oh yeah, the, these things have been found lasered on ancient temple, temples all over the world. One of the old, oldest symbols ever found was this symbol of the flower of life. So, they've been lasered on temples all over the world. They found one in the temple of Osiris, the Lord of Resurrection who taught the principle of spiritual rebirth. We will return to this subject later when we discuss the great mystery schools of Egypt. Knowledge of these principles then were passed from the Egyptian to the Hebrews through the teacher Moses, who was both a priest and an initiate in the Egyptian city of Heliopolis. Heliopolis, that's it, Heliopolis. The temple of Ra. Atom, Ra Atom. This temple was dedicated to both the visible and invisible forces behind creation, honoring Ra. This visible light of the sun and the Atom, the invisible, imperishable, one behind the manifested worlds. Moses brought this knowledge of the tree of life and the flower of life and the seed of life with him out of Egypt. It is from here that it made its way into the temples of Persia and Greece. These teachings came from the Essenes who were disseminated throughout the world. This is why we find the indications of this sacred geometry in the temples and the mosaics and the artwork of ancient Sumeria, Babylon, Greece, Persia, Rome, 
Although by the time of the Roman Empire, much of the esoteric meaning behind these symbols had been lost. Later, a derivative of this six-pointed design would become known as the Star of David. A symbol representing the, ba representing the balance of the yin and the yang forces of creation. In the mother and the father of all, while the seed of life and the flower of life were eventually lost to the Hebrews, the Star of David remains as one of their most enduring icons. After an even deeper, esoteric level, this six-sided figure is the shape of one of the seven subtle bodies. When fully activated, it becomes the Merkaba field, the energetic vehicle used by the soul to travel into the inner planes that are that developed through the meditation practice and the Enochian literature of the Merkaba was known as the chariot. An indication of this ability to transport our consciousness between the human and the celestial realms of light. And I have always known that the star was created by two fires, two pyramids coming together. And when they collide and they connect and become conscious, the I am is a force that creates that spiral of awareness and that awareness is thought in action and that is energy in motion and when these come together they form a star of David but that star of David is not a two-dimensional object it is much bigger in the dimensional aspects of it so it is, it's like a spinning star and it literally is part of your energy field and you can turn your energy field into this Merkaba transporting device and it is natural to your essence and it's just part of how your field works. When you connect to the spiritual part of yourself and you start to increase your vibration and using your imagination your imagination is how you light this ship up. It is by your ability to see in your inner mind and travel. And you're using what's within you. It feels like you're going out, but you're going in. So it's okay. It feels, it feels like you're going out. That's okay. Go out because that's how it naturally feels. So going out, you can go out into space. Go view the earth for yourself. Do a simple target like that. Go and view the sun. View these things for yourself. Use your imagination. Trust what you see. And then really process. When have I felt like this before? Because through when have I felt like this before, you get the, um, the common denominator in your perception that can bring you to that awareness. So it'll be easier for you to connect the dots if you do have some form of reference to this energy. So when have I felt like this before is a very powerful tool to help you bring in new information into your awareness. So this is the, the meaning of the Star of David is actually, the Star of David is telling you that you have a transporter inside of you that can transport your mind outside of this consciousness into the higher realms of etheric and spiritual awareness. So it's time to light up the Merkabah's kids. <laughs> so, post, per, Persephone, the eternal soul. Persephone, Persephone, I think is how you say this. The eternal soul. This is the concept of the soul and it is the cosmic seed that has fallen from the tree of life. It was woven into the deepest initiation rites of the Eleusian mysteries over 3,000 years ago and told in the story of the Greek goddess Demeter and Perse Persephone. Persephone. I cannot say that word. Sorry, guys. Many of you know how to say it right. My apologies. The Divine Mother and the Daughter. This is similar to the concepts of the Divine Father and Son in Christianity. It was a story told as an initiatory tale. Persephone is the innocent unevolved soul, the cosmic seed who has fallen from the tree of life. She is an innocent maiden who has fallen away from her connection to the divine parent and has become lost in the worlds of matter. 
In this tale, Persephone, 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 mm, Persephone, we'll go with that, is out picking up flowers in a meadow. One day when suddenly the ground beneath her opens up and Hades, the god king of the underworld, arrives in his chariot. He scoops her up and carries her off to the realm of lost spirits. Souls in the underworld that have become, become lost to themselves, having forgotten their connection to their divine spark within. After her abduction, Persephone's mother, Demeter, to look, looks for her daughter in vain, because Demeter is the earth mother of life. Her grief causes the earth to begin to dry up, and the other gods become alarmed. Eventually, Hermes, the Greek god of wisdom, reveals to Demeter that Persephone has been kidnapped and now resides in the realm of shadows. The realm of shadows. I think this is where we are. Demeter goes to the council of gods and goddesses and demands the return of her daughter, not wanting to anger Hades. They nevertheless reluctantly consent. But once they discover that Persephone has eaten six red pomegranate, pomegranate seeds during her stay in the underworld, they decree that she must spend, that she must now spend six months of every year trapped in the lower worlds with Hades, and the rest of the time she can return to the world of light and be reunited with her mother. Symbolically, this is the story within each one of us. The division, the day and the night, the dark and the light, the division of our mind, being separated from our spiritual awareness and being cut off and being brought down into matter where you forget about the connection to your mother. So, okay, so symbolically, this is the story. Uh, let me see, where was I? Kidnapped. Symbolically, this is the story of each one of us. We are each innocent seeds that have fallen into the lower worlds, separated from the great tree of life. We are thus souls who have forgotten our connection to the source and are lost in the underworld. Wow. Amazing. Two of Persephone's magical names give us great insight into the deeper meaning of this initiata initiatory story, kernel and core, the small kernel of wheat that really are like Persephone, which send a portion of time lost in the shadow world, returning to the heavenly realms between lifetimes. The underworld is the land of spiritual amnesia and the dimension where we have forgotten our divine origins. In the shadowy realms, the forces of light and darkness are just to po just opposed, pulling us first one way and then another. This creates an opportunity for the soul to make the myriad of choices in this lifetime. It can choose a path of love or fear, of sharing or of selfishness, of hope or of despair. Every day we make decisions about giving or taking anger or forgiveness, kindness or cruelty. Thus, each lifetime is a classroom of learning and our free will determines the outcome. And then we die and we rise back into the realms of light and are reunited with the Divine Mother. Wow. Deathlessness, one who lives within. All of the analogies are merely metaphors of the soul. The drop of water, the eternal flame, the cosmic seed, they are symbols of the eternal death, deathlessness, deathless, one who lives within. Like a great traveler moving through time, the soul progresses, the spark of the creator, but it is largely unaware of its own light. In the higher realms, it knows some of who or what it is. 
but as it descends lower and lower through the dimensional planes into the material form, soul goes from knowing to not knowing, from remembering to amnesia. And finally, through its own efforts over countless lifetimes, it returns to knowing once again. During the course of its long journey, it travels into the various kingdoms of God, experiencing all matter and all forms, spending time in the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms until it incarnates into the human world, where it can begin to awaken to its divine potential. Eventually, as we graduate from this plane of existence, we become sages, masters, gods, angels, taking our rightful place in the pattern of creation. Hmm. As the Persian poet Rumi wrote, 1207 to 1273, like grass I have grown over and over again. I passed out of the mineral form and lived as a plant. From the plant I was lifted up to become the animal. And then I put away the animal form and took on the human shape. Why should I fear that if I died I shall be lost? For passing human form I shall attain the flowing locks and the shining wings of angels. And then I shall become what no mind has ever conceived. Oh, let me cease to exist, for non-existence only means that I shall return to him. Manly P. Hall states this about the evolutionary journey of the soul. Man is an integral part of the whole plan of life, the, and the realization of this fact strengthens him for the accomplishment of his spiritual labor. A noble destiny awaits humanity, a way planned by a God of wisdom, ordained by a God of justice, perpetuated by a God of life, and rendered secure by a God of love. For our well-being, it is essential that we understand more of this royal bond to truth. This universe, with its love and hates, its hopes and fears. It's really what seems to be and more. The planets march in endless obeisance to their sovereign liege, the sun. Plants and animals, yes, even stones, are really pulsating, living, thinking beings. Within the all, the latent powers to achieve and thus the indwelling divinity has decreed that sometime they shall come to know the purpose for their own existence. And with joyous concord, they move together towards that end. This is the destiny. Okay. Hold on a second, I just lost my spot. Yes, and with joyous concord, they move together towards that end. It is the destiny of all that they shall accomplish all. So it's saying that we are going to accomplish all, that your destiny as a spark of divinity is to accomplish all. So you're experiencing right now as a human, you've probably experienced in so many other forms you can't even imagine, even as vast as a planet, a cosmos, a universe, a star. You're probably existing in so many forms. It would be hard to put into your mind. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean that it is not true. Because the spark of divinity that is you is connected to the seed of life and the tree of life and the cosmic egg, and the womb of all that is. So with that, those codes from your mother are in, inside of you, and the spark from your father is the life that animates you. So they are one. They are one, and they work together. And those working together, when you understand that you are more, and you connect to that true power that you are, this is how you activate the Christ. And then you become anointed, and you actually are Christed, Christed, anointed, enlightened. And you have become 
illumined. <laughs> so we will be the new true Illuminati. Isn't that going to be cool? We will light up the world and bring heaven upon earth within the consciousness of our own mind and our own awareness and our own creative forces. So, okay, so they shall accomplish all. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there for now and I will read more later. Like I said, this is a powerful book. I am so grateful to find this teaching because this is um, one of the closest things I've ever seen to how I um, was taught and, and what my belief system has become over many years of seeking God and the truth of who am I and what is my point of being here and why am I here and why is it so hard to be in matter and where are, are all these hard things that we have to go through as human beings all of those things were super hard for me to understand and um, through that process I've been seeking for a very 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 long time and through that process of seeking I found a lot of profound information and when you have these concepts in your mind and they're so different from what you've been taught it, 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 um, it produces conflict but there's also a sense of knowing so when you receive confirmation of things that you you resonate with in your soul and you resonate within you it's such a gift so Trisha McCannon oh I thank you from the bottom part of my being because this book is a beautiful gift to humanity and it is my honor and privilege to read it with people so people can experience this and hopefully absorb this information the best way that works for them. Some people need videos and they need to hear and watch and perceive information. They can't read books and absorb information the same way. So this is my number one purpose of doing this because I felt this information was very powerful and something that I should share with as many as possible because it resonates with every ounce of my being. So I hope it resonates with you too. Take what works for you, throw what doesn't down the toilet and flush it because we we learn in chunks and in pieces so um, take what works for you and do not worry about what doesn't only focus on that which resonates because that's what you're ready for that's what you're supposed to learn that's what you're supposed to resonate with so we're all going to pick up different parts of these teachings and resonate deeply with them. Some of them will not resonate with you at all. And that's okay because we're built different and we're expressing different rays of creation. And with that, all of our differences are the fullness of our power. So I love you guys and you guys are all part of my rainbow. So shine bright connect to the power of what you are which is coming from the sun and the stars and the mother and the father and the cosmos and all these beautiful energies that we cannot see so much love to you namaste i will read more soon have a beautiful sunday and i'll talk to you soon bye bye